This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. 106,000 Americans are waiting for an organ transplant. Yet federal officials have raised serious questions about the national transplant system known as UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. It is a matter of life and death. On average, 22 people die each day waiting. That's according to the National Academies of Sciences. Coming up later, where we live, we learn about a confidential government report and a two and a half year Senate investigation, both finding serious weaknesses in the transplant system. And we learn why they recommend an overhaul of the network. Washington Post health and medicine reporter Lenny Bernstein joins us later. And we also hear from the chief of transplant surgery at Hartford Hospital. Now, do you have experience with the organ transplant system? We want to hear from you. Our number, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Share a comment on Facebook or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. First, we wanted to talk to a Connecticut resident who is waiting for an organ donor. Kevin Pru lives in Madison, Connecticut. He has end-stage liver disease and is on the wait list for a liver transplant, and he's searching for a living donor. He joins us now on the phone with his wife, Amy, who manages their Facebook page, Kevin's Journey to Liver Transplant. She's also a volunteer with New England Donor Services. Kevin and Amy Pru, welcome to our show. Thanks, Lucy. We appreciate you. you having us. Good morning. Good morning. Kevin, I'll start with you. I understand you were listed for a transplant back in March 2020, and now you're also a candidate for a living donor. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey on to the wait list and what it's been like? Yeah, and it, at times I'll, um, I'll um, deviate or deflect to my wife because she actually knows more about it and has more education as a patient. You're so much focused on your individual health and, and path. But the um, I was diagnosed probably two and a half, three years ago <clears throat> uh, with having some form of um, liver condition, um, which just slowly um, but expeditiously over a six-month period of time um, became very problematic uh, as a health condition. Um, between the ability to walk, the ability to function, and manifested itself. And um, one of the byproducts is called ascites, where your fluid doesn't process, your liver doesn't process the fluids going through it, so they call it sweating. And all that fluid just goes into your abdomen, causing pressure on your your, uh, other organs. Um, So... In order to do that, I went through many procedures called paracentesis, um, where they actually drain the fluid from you. Um, and if you could only imagine uh, uh, going in in the morning and an hour and a half later coming out 22 pounds lighter uh, because 11 liters of fluid had been taken off you, that's how much pressure um, I was experiencing then. Um I've been listed, to get back to your question, I've been listed for two and a half years. Um, we've, um, at that point in time, um, our team at Yale, which is, has been absolutely fabulous. I understand you're talking to somebody at Harvard Hospital today, and I'm sure they're just as uh, great. But our team um, has has done everything uh, amazing, um, you know, led by my primary doctor, uh, Dr. Uh, Leah Pecos. So the, the, <clears throat> what they've encouraged me to do and us to do, and that's the genesis of the page, is um, to um, search for a living donor, um, which is a tough journey for me personally, and then I'll let my wife talk about it briefly. Um, because if, as a private individual, you're all of a sudden very vulnerable and putting your whole life out there. Mm-hmm. But the reality quickly around a living donor is what most people don't know is that you can donate a portion of your liver and it will regenerate in six to eight weeks. Um, and the recipient body can take that portion, which will regenerate to a full functioning liver in six to eight weeks in their body. Um, and that's just something that somebody, people don't know. They're aware of liver transplants 
from deceased donors, but not living donors. So. Well, thank you for uh, for explaining that to us, Kevin. Amy, I understand you're the spokesperson for the family. Again, you created that Facebook page, Kevin's Journey to Liver Transplant, and you're volunteer with the New England Donor Services. And so tell us what it's been like to try to find a living donor. Uh, and, you know, when you think about who you're reaching out to, you know, how va- how wide a net you're casting. For sure. It, it's been a challenge. Um, I, there's so many different uh Level so many different aspects that you're trying to um, sort of pay attention to and take care of. But a number one for us, um, you know, the the waiting list, as um, most people are aware, is long. Um, you're told that from the get go. Um, I think unless it's an absolutely acute case, um, you know, where uh, you know, a donor is found immediately for someone, um, you know, suffering, you know, acutely. But um, other than that, you know, you're you're tasked with, um, you know, sharing your story and, and hoping to find a living donor. And, of course, you know, we start with these rings with our closest family and um, and friends. But uh, even though you, you start there, it's, it's not really an ask. You, mm-hmm. you don't really, you don't. We're not comfortable asking anyone for part of their organs, um, but you, you know, we share our story um, because there are altruistic donors, there are family members who um, may be interested, but um, we in no way ever wanted to impose or have anyone feel obligated. Um, I did um, approach the, the Center for Living Organ Donors at, at Yale on Kevin's behalf. Um, I'm not the right blood type, nor are our children, so that kind of eliminated our, our most immediate family. Um, so then what we, we did was um, we got brave and we just chose to share our story more publicly, and we created uh, kind of a Christmas card-type mailing, if you will, uh, with Kevin's picture. And our story, um, we always feel it better to, you know, speak accurately from the source. Um, mm-hmm. And we chose to, you know, really be as authentic and accurate as possible and as informative as possible. So we, we provided information on the card about um, both living and deceased donor um, types. Um, and as we've gone along, we've had a, a many, 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 many people call uh, to inquire, to be tested. Um, we have had uh, three very, very close calls, um, individuals who have uh, gone to Yale for two days of full-scale testing um, and unfortunately have just not um, been the, the right and accurate match, the perfect match of, for the consideration of both the donor and the recipient. So, so what we've done then is... Um, you know, done the mailing. We've um, just decided to kind of share our story on on Facebook, and I have spread out a little bit into Instagram. But um, Facebook seems to be able to, seems to be a little more a um, uh, little easier for me to to use uh, to share the story, almost in a diary type form. Um, and as we've gone along, we've we've you know come across so many people who have reached out who have either received a donation or um, have been a donor themselves, and they're encouraging and and, uh, they provide hope. And so what we've learned and what we felt is that, yes, Kevin has the need, and that's the reason for our journey, Um, and we will continue to primarily, you know, hope to find a living donor Mm -hmm. for Kevin, but... um, uh, well, Amy, Sorry, that's okay. Amy, yeah. um, something both you and Kevin mentioned, even just the ask of of finding someone who's willing uh, to be a living donor. We heard from a listener who also had to look for a living donor, and he shared this with us uh, when he's thinking about this uh, wide net. For me, that was one of the most difficult parts, he told us, asking for something mm-hmm. so huge from friends, family, and even strangers was pretty gut-wrenching. And he goes on to say, even today, five years post-transplant, I'm still reckoning with the effects that that question had on some of my relationships from folks who I never imagined would consider such a request, who jumped at the chance, to others who I thought I could count on who just weren't up for it. I'm wondering if you could respond to what he shared, uh, Amy and Kevin. 
It, absolutely, uh, 100% agree. Um, we chose not to ask um, point blank. Mm-hmm. Oh, just to to share the story. It's too was too too much to to ask of anyone. But sharing the story and letting it evolve, and lo and behold, yes, the the people that have um, stepped up or just um, called, and and some will let us know. Others. You know, we don't know that they've called. Um, it, it's a, it's kind of a very tough emotional thing all the way, all around. Um, and so um, we kind of look to the to the greater good here in in going through this journey. If we can, if the purpose is to share our story, it can maybe help others as well. It can start the conversation. And uh, we've met some wonderful, wonderful people through uh, New England Donor Services and Donate Life Connecticut um, who have kind of helped us to get comfortable with the process and understanding that by sharing our story, if we can raise awareness uh, for the value of um, what a a donated organ can do, and um, then then that will be good as well. It will be good for, for all those waiting because, you know, as you said at the top of the story, there are, are hundreds of thousands of people waiting. Um, and, if, and if more people were registered as deceased donors, um, you know, we're, we're choosing to search, you know, and tell our story for Kevin in the hopes of a living donor so that it can be, you know, sooner than later so we don't have to wait till he's, um, you know, bedridden and, and you know, um, Scheduling a living donor transplant is actually, um, we're told, for, could produce a, a you know more favorable outcome. Um, but a deceased donor, and, and many many people have had deceased donors, and, and their stories provide us hope. And so we've we've you know we're inspired by it all. Um, I actually had an aunt who was transplanted in 1989. Uh, she had a liver transplant at Yale. So we know what good can come of that. That was from a deceased donor. Um, we also have had um, an unfortunate experience. Kevin's dad passed away from liver disease in 2013. So we've experienced that side of things as well. And now we find ourselves kind of in this middle limbo area um, and doing all that we can, you know, trying to take some control of um our destiny here. And and Amy, you mentioned that this feeling of being in limbo. Uh, Kevin, I, I just wanted you uh, to respond uh, to what Amy shared and, you know, what it's been like for you day to day. Um, what I, I guess the best way I can paint it is, you know, <clears throat> the events that Amy uh, shared have been roller coasters when you you know, and everybody had told us early on it's like a roller coaster. We didn't know what that meant. We don't. We know what it means now, um, but we didn't know what that meant early on. Almost through the orientation, the programming, getting familiar, getting ourselves educated on this. But with every hope and everything that doesn't work out, there's highs and lows emotionally. Um, the reality for me is um, I have a great family. I'm sorry if I get emotional. I can I can tell that you have a wonderful wife. We have wonderful children. We have a new granddaughter. And so, you know, those are the things that keep us going on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think it makes the highs higher and the lows lower. But um, the reality is this was unplanned and so many things for people are unplanned so i i'm not lacking sympathy or unempathetic to that um, everybody can jump us can have a story and put it parallel to this it's opened my eyes to that um but i had so much more to give and so much more to do you still do he still does well, a- Amy, I know uh, you and Kevin have said that you're both hopeful, you're getting the story out, you're encouraging uh, people uh, to learn more about becoming a living donor. Can you let our listeners know where they can go to either get more information or to to help Kevin? For sure. Um, 
for Kevin specifically, um, the, the easiest access is to our um, Facebook page, which you referenced, and that's Kevin's Journey to Liver Transplant. It's a public page, so um, you don't have to be on Facebook. You can just Google that, uh, Kevin's Journey to Liver Transplant, and it'll it'll come up, and you a- anyone can can see that. Um, uh, on there is the phone number to the Yale Transplant Center, the Center for Living Organ Donors, and that phone number is 866-925-3897. Um, the great folks there in the um, Center for Living Organ Donation uh, um, will process the call um, and kind of uh, vet um, potential donors with the proper questions regarding um, blood type and um, health history and all of that. Um, that's their job, and they do a great job of it. We we don't vet anyone. Mm-hmm. We just direct them to the phone number. So if anyone is interested in calling, that would be a, a wonderful um, uh, gift and, and a gift of hope for us as well. But um, in addition, anyone who, listening who is inspired by organ donation, um, just as end-of-life donors, um, registerme.org is um, a link to go to to register as a deceased donor. Um, No need to go through surgery or or do that while you're living, Um, but it does help because not every death is one that results in organs um, being able to be harvested. So um, that is something that... um, you know, is a personal choice, um, but registerme.org for deceased uh, donor registration. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that information and for coming on to tell us your story. Amy and Kevin Prue, again, they're Madison, Connecticut residents. We'll share that information on our website and our social. Kevin, all my best to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Now, coming up after the break, we're going to learn about a confidential government report and a two and a half year Senate investigation, both finding some serious weaknesses in the transplant system in the U.S., and we learn why they recommend an overhaul of the network. Washington Post health and medicine reporter Lenny Bernstein joins us, and later we hear from the chief of transplant surgery at Hartford Hospital. Now, do you have experience with the organ transplant system? You can join us, too, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You're listening to Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're taking a deep dive into the nation's organ transplant system after a confidential government report and Senate investigation found multiple concerns with the United Network for Organ Sharing, known as UNOS. Now, the Washington Post obtained the confidential review of UNOS by the U.S. Digital Service that was completed 18 months ago. And this month, the Post reported on the Senate Finance Committee's two-and-a-half-year investigation into the nation's organ transplant system, finding widespread deficiencies. The Senate report finding 70 people died and 249 developed diseases after mistakes in the screening of organs they received in transplants. Washington Post reporter Lenny Bernstein is with us now to tell us more. Lenny, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, There were several articles by the Post looking into uh, the transplant network and and why officials say that the network needs vast restructuring. So break it down for us. Sure. Um, I wanted to say very quickly that I was very sorry to hear Kevin's story. um, And and I'm I'm really uh, thinking of him and rooting for him. I hope he finds a living donor. Um, the You can think of the um, digital service as sort of a red team or a strike team that gets invited into different um, agencies, uh, sometimes nonprofits, but mostly federal agencies to examine their tech. And they're really top-notch engineers. Uh, they were invited by one of the government agencies, HRSA, to look into the tech that UNOS 
uses to run our transplant system. And they found that it is highly flawed. Um, first of all, it has never been fully audited by anyone in the federal government, which is alarming because UNOS has run the system for 36 years. Um, it crashes. Um, it may crash a little bit more often than uh, the kinds of crashes that we are familiar with in the systems that we use. Um, it's not in the cloud. Uh, the algorithms that are used are so complicated and so interwoven that when they want to make a policy change, it can take a very long time to just push that through their tech. Um, and uh, it relies on a lot of manual input, uh, which in the day of electronic medical records is not a good thing. Um, subsequently, the Senate came out with its own two and a half year investigation of the system. And that also was very wide ranging, but uh, they examined hundreds of thousands of documents. And one of the documents they found was a UNOS report that showed that from uh, 2015 to 2022, uh, the um, 70 people died and uh, 249 caught diseases as a result of their transplant. Um, I mean, I have the years correct off the top of my head, but it was a seven year period. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be quick to say there were over 170,000 transplants during that period. And so, you know, it's a teeny tiny little fraction, but still these were preventable mistakes. They were blood typing mistakes. They were failure to screen. Um, they also found that a lot of organs go to waste. About 21% of kidneys procured in this country are never transplanted. Uh, those are the result of transit mistakes. They are the result of surgeons being very picky about the organs they use. They are the result of mistakes made by the uh, organ procurement organizations. Um, there was a surgeon who testified at the at the hearing on this that um, you know there were organs stashed in a uh, storage center overnight. And then by the time they got to her, they were useless. We've mentioned, so, um, sorry, Lenny, you mentioned yeah. UNOS now. I'm wondering if you could then maybe describe the network because there's the UNOS that's based, I believe, in Virginia. It's a nonprofit, but then how it interacts with what are known as organ procurement organizations. Because when we think about some of the mistakes that are being made, you know, who's responsible here? Yes, it's a complicated system. Um, the government gives 57 small nonprofits called organ procurement organizations monopolies over little pieces of territory. The country is divided up into 57 pieces and they each OPO is responsible for one of those pieces, but no one can compete with them. They have, they have the contract. They procure the organs at hospitals uh, when somebody dies, when someone, uh, when a brain death occurs. And I wanted to point out that very small percentage of deaths are eligible for transplant. So it's a difficult job. And UNOS sits at the center of this and coordinates it with some monitoring from the government, but not very much. And that is one of the core problems here. Mm -hmm. um, they take these organs and in the most, most of the time, more than 80% of the time, they are kidneys and they bring them to the transplant hospitals. Often they send them on airplanes, um, but with livers and hearts, um, surgeons will sometimes, oftentimes, come out and get them themselves because they are so rare and valuable. Mm. Uh, when we think about what the investigators uncovered, I understand that UNOS doesn't have any motivation to modernize. Uh, there has been not much scrutiny of this network. Uh, you mentioned HRSA that oversees them. So what can the government do moving forward to fix this, you know, worried about uh, hacking or further mistakes? Yeah, you've put your finger on the core problem here. When the National Organ Transplant Act was written in 1984, it was written with UNOS in mind. And uh, UNOS, it was written in such a way that it has to be a nonprofit and it has to be a single contract. UNOS won that contract and subsequently has, without any competition, won the next six contracts. So UNOS has held this contract since we had a law on transplant, 36 years. It considers the tech that it uses to be its own. That is, it doesn't belong to the government, it belongs to UNOS, a nonprofit organization based in Richmond, Virginia. So its motivation is to hold on to this contract as long as it can. It's a $65 million contract with six and a half million coming from the government. It's not a huge contract, 
by any means by government standards, but it's good contract and it employs a lot of people. It resists efforts from the government to make it modernize. Why? We don't really know. Would, is it the spending of money? Is it uh, that uh, something would change? We don't really know why UNOS has been so slow to modernize. But we, what we do know is the only way to create competition with UNOS is for Congress to change the law. And as you know, that's a very difficult lift these days. That's for sure. You're hearing with us on Zoom, Lenny Bernstein, health and medicine reporter at the Washington po- at Washington Post, as we learn about uh, its investigation and reporting on the national organ transplant system known as UNOS. If you have a question or comment, you can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we're going to hear from a local transplant uh, surgeon uh, from Hartford HealthCare. Uh, but when we think about the Senate investigation, Lenny, and I think there were more, about 1,100 complaints uh, when it when there were mistakes or issues with uh, transplants or trying to find uh, an, an organ uh, match. And I'm wondering how UNOS has dealt with these complaints, and, and you know, is that also part of the problem? Yes, you've raised an important point here. Um, one of the most valuable things that the Senate did that no one has been able to do before was to go in and get, through subpoena uh, and other means, all the complaints that went to UNOS about problems. One of UNOS's jobs is to monitor these complaints, to investigate them, and if necessary, to sanction the organization, whether it's a transplant hospital or an OPO or a lab that made a mistake. Um, What the Senate showed was that own, uh, that less than half of them really amount to anything. They're, they're sort of more than half are kind of ignored or discarded or nothing really happens to them. And only once or twice has there been any kind of sanction uh, from UNOS to the organization. Now, UNOS insists that it relies on a system it calls peer review, which is we're a coach. We want to help this OPO get better. We want to help this transplant center not make this mistake again. The problem is that we're now 40 years into the system without accountability, without someone punishing someone for making the same mistakes over and over again, nothing changes. That's why in 2019, the government took the very first initial steps to make OPOs better at collecting organs from hospitals. Many of them underperform in this area. There could be thousands more organs in circulation according to the government, if these OPOs did a better job. And again, OPOs mean organ procurement organizations. Yes, the 57 small nonprofits around the country that pick up organs at hospitals and make sure that they get to transplant centers. You know, I started the the show talking about the people that are waiting, uh, I think nearly 106,000 Americans. And so what does all this, these reviews happening on the federal level mean for people currently on the list, Lenny? I'm afraid it doesn't mean very much immediately. Um, The hope is that reform will uh, take shape and grow and that the system will be made more efficient, more accountable, uh, so that there are more organs in circulation. There is less waste of organs that are so badly needed by people. And that over time, possibly, you know, five years, 10 years, I, I'm, I'm really making that up, uh, you would have a system that whittles away at that list and brings it you know, to a much smaller number of people waiting for organs. Lenny Bernstein, again, is health and medicine reporter at The Washington Post as we talk about this network um, responsible for organ transplants uh, and finding organs uh, for donor matches. You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we're going to get another perspective from a longtime transplant surgeon at Hartford HealthCare, Dr. Glenn Morgan. We're going to take your questions, too. Now, have you had experience with the organ transplant system? Join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
You're listening to Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. We're taking a deep dive into the nation's organ transplant system. Washington Post reporter Lenny Bernstein is with us. And joining us now with another perspective is a longtime transplant surgeon, the current chief of transplant surgery at Hartford Hospital, Dr. Glenn Morgan. Dr. Morgan, welcome to our show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Lucy. Listeners can join as well, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Lenny says this is a complicated system. Uh, when we look at the reporting by the Washington Post, um, you know, one of the uh, findings, the White House's U.S. Digital Service found the technology that matches donated organs nationwide to patients has failed repeatedly. There are regular system crashes, so a need for modernization, and there's a reliance still on manual data input. So as a transplant surgeon, what's been your experience? Yeah, no, it is a it is a really important uh, topic. And, and in the field, we've been talking about the uh, ability to modernize, the ability to go mobile, especially because we are constantly on the move, not just as, as people and surgeons are, are people we're moving about and the ability to access the system to uh, get organ offers, to assess organ offers has been very important. Um, in terms of uh, so-called crashes, um, personally, I can't uh, say that I've experienced that too often. I know they have regi- uh, regular um, maintenance for their network, and, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm aware of that. Um, but I haven't personally been affected by um, uh, out- outages or, or downtime so much. What has been one of the things we've asked for in the trenches, so to speak, is to modernize and to get a digital uh, mobile platform. And it took many, many years for us to finally have um, a, a mobile uh, platform that we can look at organ offers to assess them and to make decisions. Uh, and even then, it's not, it's not an application. It's not an app that we can use on our phones and iPads. It's, uh, it's really just um, uh, access to, uh, to a site. Um, and it's far better than it used to be, but it's still by a lot of modern standards, I would say, and I'm not an expert in, the, in this area of technology, it, it's still just sort of on the um, early stages of evolution. So a lot of work still to be done, I think, on the digital side of things and the mobile side in particular. Uh, when we heard uh, Lenny uh, talk about that Senate investigation and how they found, you know, that some, sometimes organs were wasted, you know, I'm wondering, you know, how big of a problem is that, especially when we hear stories like Kevin Prue at the top of the show, you know, waiting for so long and, you know, wanting to make sure that the system is, you know, robust and responsible because people's lives are at stake here. Absolutely. Yeah. Organ discards are, are a big problem and it's a multifactorial issue. Um, the, the, not all deaths, as you heard, are eligible for organ donation. In fact, a very tiny percentage of, of uh, deaths are actually uh, eligible for organ donation. And a lot of these organs, uh, despite careful vetting, will, will just not be suitable, either physiologically, anatomically, uh, for whatever reason. But I know we can do better. I think everybody in the transplant community on both sides of the fence uh, agrees that we can do better with uh, decreasing discard rates. Um, I do want to point out that uh, Kevin's situation is very different because he's at this point looking uh, to obtain uh, a living donor organ. So not at all what we're mm-hmm. talking about here with the UNOS uh, technology and the discard rates. Um, but still, discard rates, uh, we should be working very hard to um, uh, to minimize. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that there's almost various conflicting missions because as the transplant center our mission of course is to get our patients healthy it's to to get them through this process to give them a new starting line for their lives and so we're driven by getting transplants done and doing transplants uh, as often as possible that's the mission that's our new uh, mission and not a new mission but a, a reinvigorated mission based on person metrics for the last year to do more transplants to get more people off lists and back to their families and their and their communities. Um, But we're also under tremendous scrutiny by regulatory agencies for outcomes and uh, insurance companies will be looking at that they will grant contracts, they will um, award centers of excellence contracts based on these data. And so when transplant centers are looking at organs, they're there's this conflicting mission Well, we want to get more transplants done, but we have to do the best we have to do 
the cases that are 100% successful are most likely to yield the highest degrees of success. So it makes it, there's a, this conflict about trying to get as many transplants done with the organs available, knowing that not all of these are going to be um, ideal, so to speak. So there is a, there is a push pull for the transplant center. And then of course, UNOS and the OPO is in the middle and they have their uh, mission and their vision for the way things should work. So there are these three competing entities when we should all really be moving forward in in unison, or at least in harmony. Mm. When we think about the the OPO, the organ procurement organizations that serve this region, do you have full confidence in in the work that they're doing uh, to find matches and to help with uh, transportation uh, to your hospital? Yeah, I, you know, I do. The, in this area, in New England, it's called New England Donor Services. Uh, they do an excellent job. It's a challenge for everybody, um, especially in the last several years, because the organ allocation systems in the United States changed recently, particularly uh, as it uh, pertained to first lungs, then hearts, then livers, and then kidneys in that order in the last uh, six or seven years. And so organs that used to be uh limited uh to a large degree based on geography have now those geographic barriers have been taken away which was a very good thing for our patients so the patients who are the most in need the critically ill patients are now getting organs at a much higher rate so the success rates for getting organs to critically ill patients have gone up there's still a big need for patients who are more stable but uh, getting those organs to people because the geographic boundaries have been taken down are now we're dealing with a lot more logistic challenges, getting these organs from point A to point B. So we used to get organs primarily from New England. Now it's very unusual for us to get organs from the New England area. We'll be getting them from the Midwest or the South because uh, of the dropping of these geographic uh, uh, barriers. So it's been good, but it's also a challenge when you think of uh, logistics. Mm -hmm. You're hearing Dr. Glenn Morgan here on the show, Chief of Transplant Surgery at Hartford Hospital. Lenny Bernstein still with us, health and medicine reporter at the Washington Post. Post, Lenny, I wanted to hear your response to Dr. Morgan's perspective, including that that uh, conflict that he had mentioned. Um, I agree completely uh, with what he said. Um, I think organ transplantation is a medical miracle. I've studied it now for years. Um, the advances made since early organ transplantation, both in technique and uh, in um, immunosuppression uh, are incredible. And, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people alive today because we have this in our country. Um, that said, the government has put Dr. Morgan and his colleagues in a difficult position. At, they are judged on the success rate of their patients. How many of them are still alive X years down the road. So the incentive for Dr. Morgan and other transplant surgeons is to pick the very best organs, to look them over carefully and say, this is the one that's most appropriate for my patient. That's terrific, but it means they might pass on some and they may go elsewhere or they may not be used. And so he is in a very difficult position um, trying to satisfy both goals that he mentioned. Dr. Morgan, I, I wanted to go back to you because I, I am curious about the screening process for both eligibility and matching donors because when we hear that the Senate Finance Committee's investigation uh, looking at these complaints with UNOS, again, 70 people dying, 250 others developing diseases after organ transplants. Again, that is a tiny fraction as of all transplants done, as Lenny mentioned. But even this reliance on manual uh, input of data. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that and, you know, you know again, other places where the system could be improved? Yeah, it, it's, um, first of all, without knowing the details, because as as you uh, are very much aware, the devil's in the details. So uh, when we talk about these, um, I'm not sure uh, that we're dealing with data entry errors or uh, issues where, for example, a donor would be identified, an organ will be transplanted, and then weeks to months later, it's found that a disease has been transmitted, such as a virus. So I suspect a lot of these are like that. 
and before the technology existed, for example, to check donors for hepatitis C uh, with you know accuracy windows of 24 to 48 hours, so transitions or transmissions of diseases like that could occur. Uh, we're now a lot better at that, and the system, medical science, is a lot better at detecting uh, uh, these diseases, just as we are with COVID. We can now turn over a COVID test uh, in an hour. So I suspect some of these things may just be dated, and in medical technology terms, even a few years can outdate something quite significantly. The data entry side is really a lot of that comes on the transplant center end where our staff have to enter data on patients who are either being added to eligibility lists um, or are being expected to be reported on after transplant and how they're doing. Um, and you'll notice I use the term eligibility list, which is really an important distinction uh, because most organs are allocated uh, and kidneys are the one exception to this, but the other organs are allocated based on the severity of one's illness or basically stratifying how ill your organ is making you. Uh, kidneys are the only exception. Kidneys are still allocated largely on the amount of time you've been waiting for a kidney, um, but the others are, are uh, allocated based on how sick you are uh, or how sick your organ failure is making you. Hmm. Lenny, did you want to respond when we think about, you know, the data that was used in the Senate report and even, you know, where some of these errors uh, were uh, encountered in terms of, you know, people getting sick or dying? I'm going to pick out one area that um, a couple of surgeons mentioned to us uh, and then testified as well at the Senate hearing, and that's tracking of organs. Um, you know, has been so slow in developing its own technology to track an organ. Let's say it's coming all the way across the country, uh, or as Dr. Morgan uh, pointed out, from a very great distance, more, which more and more of them are now. UNOS has been so slow in developing its own tracking technology that docs sometimes use other means to follow their organs. Um, one, uh, one woman testified at the hearing that she looked at their technology and decided it was so poor that she went with a commercially available uh, tracking system. Uh, another doc we quoted in the story said, look, if we can know where our meal is through DoorDash, if we can know where our Amazon order is at every step of the way, why can't we know where a kidney is? And right now, and I'd like to hear if this occurs to Dr. Morgan, that's not always possible. Dr. Morgan? Yeah, no, Lenny's absolutely uh, spot on on this. It actually, we, we actually now, and it's just starting to happen within the last year, um, organs are packed now with GPS devices in the packaging so we can track them, but it's not universal. And again, kidneys are often transported either by land or by air without any, um, uh, there, there's no accompanying uh, physician or medical uh, staff person. So they're uh, often, you know, put on an airplane or on a bus or it could be anything, frankly, and, and moving along. So having those for the GPS is very important. Uh, other organs such as um, hearts are often accompanied by the medical team, livers, maybe half the time are accompanied by the medical team, but it would be nice to be absolutely sure that you could just drop a chip into a box and make sure that you knew 100% of the time where these, uh, where these organs are. That It's gotten better. We do now get um, uh, a significant proportion that can be tracked, um, but it's certainly not um, universal. Mm. Before we run out of time, again, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Morgan, when we think about, you know, steps moving forward, uh, you know, the government review refers to UNOS again, the United Network for Organ Sharing as a monopoly, very little checks and balances outside of the nonprofit. The government also has little power. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, is this a positive trait of the organization to not have this government interference? Or do you think that there's more room for regulation? Yeah, I mean, as with many things, I, I mean, Definitely the separation of the technology aspect and the policy making aspect would be, I think, wonderful. I, I don't think there's any of us that would disagree with that. Uh, well, I shouldn't speak for the entire transplant community, but that I would certainly be in favor of that, separating out the technology from the policy making. 
the policy making, the allocation, the things that we do as a transplant community, and this involves people from all areas. We're talking the surgeons, we're talking patients, we're talking community members, we're talking LPO staff. Everybody's involved in the policy making that goes into the organ transplant system. Um, so that is a good thing. That's a good thing that something so highly specialized is taken care of by the people who are most invested, the, the stakeholders that actually have the experience and are sort of uh, in the trenches. Um, but it, it does concern me that one entity has really been, you know, the only entity to manage this contract since its inception. So um, it, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to have some competition. Uh, unquestionably separating out the technology would be a good thing, but keeping the oversight of policy and uh, procedure bylaws is still, I think, very important to have with uh, the transplant professionals and people who really have um, uh, a significant stake in the success of the whole system. Lenny Bernstein, uh, before we uh, lose uh, um, time uh, for the hour, you know, again, what will you be watching for in the next weeks and months when we think about, you know, Congress's role, uh, even when we think about this contract to UNOS? The critical thing that everyone is watching right now is whether this obscure government agency, the Health uh, Resources and Services Administration, which is the direct supervisor of UNOS, whether it writes the request for proposals, which is essentially saying, we're gonna put out another five-year contract, whether it writes it in a way that other nonprofits can compete for the technology part of the contract. If it doesn't, which it hasn't for 30 some odd years, then little will change on that. Uh, if it does, then we will see a, a very interesting new landscape. Again, that's Lenny Bernstein, health and medicine reporter at the Washington Post. We have links on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live to the Washington Post's reporting. Lenny, what a what a pleasure to talk with you. And again, you're a Hartford Current alum, so even better to have you on the show today. Anytime. Also, thank you so much to Dr. Glenn Morgan, Chief of Transplant Surgery at Hartford Hospital. Thanks for your expertise, Dr. Morgan. Thanks for having me, Lucy. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show is produced by talk show intern Anya Grandolski. Good luck this fall, Anya. Also, thanks to Katie Tolarski and Katie Pellico. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. Learn more. Just download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. Back tomorrow. Mm-hmm.